Hello and welcome to Amazing Meetings by Bartosz Zieleźnik and Louis Nichrini, the international podcast for coaches, facilitators and managers. Hello there, I'm Bartosz and welcome to Amazing Meetings episode 7. This time we are exploring the wonderful world of online learning with an all-star productivity instructor, Piotr Nabielec. If you're bored, you go for entertainment, not for challenge. Right now in the times that you feel some emotion that's not nice, then you just do something to feel nicer. And sometimes it's okay, but sometimes our emotions are calling us to like stop and reflect. We discover what it takes to be a successful learner as well as an online instructor. If you turn your mind into curiosity and experimenting, that's a completely different story. It's like, hey, I'll try his strategy in the morning for a week and see what happens. We also bring you simple productivity hacks that may just make your life a little bit easier. I'm really strong advocate of habits because they clear out the obvious stuff out of your way and then you can focus on what really matters. Lessons learned from teaching slow productivity online. That's amazing meetings with Piotr, Bartosz and Louis. Our guest today is Piotr Nabielec, who since 2015 has been building courses that help people organize the chaos and build good habits around time management. He calls that slow productivity, which is the term we absolutely love and adore on this show because we're both very slow, as you know. (laughs) And what Piotr does, he balances between goals, rest, relationships and creative time in his work and courses. Before that... He spent over 10 years in IT as a software developer and manager. So hello, Piotr, and welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for the invitation, guys. Piotr, I was really excited when uh, when Bartosz told me that we're going to be speaking to a time management specialist, specifically in this uh, work-from-home time that we have now. I think many of us... uh, you know, we, we kind of found ourselves sitting at our home desk going like, yeah, I've got all the time in the world. And then come five o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, what did I actually do today? Is that a, is that a reality that you're exposed to currently? Uh, so my situation is that I have my own situation, but I have like all my people in the courses and I get feedback. So recently I finished a course with over 130 people and I, and I had an insight to like their daily lives actually through the whole situation in, for the lockdown. And so I, I think that people divide into two categories. The first category is people with kids and the second is without kids. <laughs> because if you're left at home with kids, your primary goal is to survive, <laughs> okay? Not kill anyone and just like, this is the primary goal of this time. And people that have more time, it's like, hey, I discover myself, I'm like reading books and stuff like that. So this is completely like two realities. But I think that the principles are, are pretty much the same for both. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> oh, wow. So are you saying that pets don't count as kids? <laughs> no, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was, I, I've been using that excuse for, for three months now. I, I, have to, I have to revisit my assumptions now. So, Piotr, tell us a little bit about your background. So, you know, we know you worked in IT for 10 years as a developer and a software development team manager. So what made you transition into the role of online coach and facilitator now? That's usually very simple, but complicated. (laughs) (laughs) So I was hired as a software developer. That was my love at the time. I quickly realized that I'm actually my first job was at Motorola. So I was surrounded by guys that really know what they're doing. And I quickly realized that even good software developers or even managers are really poorly organized in my thoughts. So, so that's what I was seeing. And because that was my passion already for, for the, let's say, few years back, I started, I was, that was my also growing interest in Scrum, uh, which is like a lightweight project management methodology. And I quickly became a Scrum Master, actually certified Scrum Master in 2009. So that was pretty long time ago. And I know Bart was mm-hmm. Scrum Master also, so he knows what I'm mm-hmm. talking about. Yes, we share that part of the story. That transitioned me to, to be like more facilitator. Um, I run retrospectives and like I started managing more and more. So that was the first step. 
I think I, I should mention also the Strength Finder test, which is actually now called Clifton Strengths that I did in 2007, I think, like very late December. And my top team number one was developer, which is developing people. And then I realized that I'll be probably slowly progressing from being a software developer to people developer because that was my passion. I also realized I was teaching other at school, helping other, other students at schools. That was my whole life, actually. So let's say it grew over time. I became a manager. I had to onboard people. I had to train them. I realized actually training is the passion, which is even bigger than, than software development. And then uh, I created my company for training. So I started training more companies to have also more insights into how people work. And uh, from, let's say, developing future managers in IT, I narrowed down and narrowed down. And that's how I finished in time management, because I think this is very useful skill, especially in, in crazy times. And there's not many actually good um, sources about it, in my opinion. Uh, there's very general knowledge about it, but then people say, Hey, but yeah, like, what do I do? What like install an app? Like I know all these principles and like nice words, but then what do I do? And this is like my style. So that's what I was, nice. I started, you know, to do. one of my early memories of you as a sort of agile enthusiast, uh, was in one of those, um, agile coach camp. Uh, scenarios where it's like an or like an open environment and yeah. <laughs> the people run their own sessions and you get to pick where you are and I remember we both ended up in the same sessions and I remember you tried to get a group of people together who just wanted to share practicalities just like how do you move your tickets in Jira yeah. how do you label this and I, I remember you just asked like <laughs> all the questions I had I always had the back of my head but I was I don't know it felt like this little secret thing everybody has their own little mojo so I love how you're all about sharing and we know you have a very popular Udemy course that got released just recently and if I'm not mistaken it has a rating of about 4.8 on Udemy is that oh correct? that's the past <laughs> That's the best. Okay. <laughs> 1.2 now? Okay. <laughs> no, it was 4.8 for quite a long time, then dropped. Let's say the more people came, it, I think it's, it was stable around 4.7. But then like two and a half months ago, I joined Udemy for Business. And with Udemy for Business, people have like, they usually didn't pay for themselves. And maybe <laughs> they also have different expectations. So like the course rating dropped by 0 0.2 in like two weeks oh my. and now it's stable and 4.5 or maybe we'll be oscillating between 4.5 and 4.6 but that is still the world record look this is my profession i work in lnd every day so i know the course ratings in udemy for business firsthand so anything above 4.3 is definitely worth recommending so that's at least that's my experience yeah gold standard gold so, standard and i took the course so uh so I know it's an all star course and it's and it's brilliant. So what made you decide to go into this online area with your training? Uh, of course, as with many steps in my career, frustration. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing I, I was doing offline trainings and so I have like 15 people in a class for two days. Mm. That's yeah, the money is good for that. But, you know, the. The change I can have and the, the in people's lives is not so big. So I start sharing maybe the best practices. So if people after the courses, the offline courses started asking me questions like, hey, can you send me a little bit more materials about this or that? Then I wrote an article on my blog and I send that article as like a compilation of knowledge. And then basically I realized that if I do a course uh, out of that, it's like I accumulated knowledge of, let's say, three years of offline trainings. And then I realized, hey, this is a, a good material to, to start online. So there are two. Actually, I have one pretty big course in Polish, um, which really take a lot of my time. And so the number of participants is really limited. And, and I realized that also many people ask for just a general knowledge, like best practices, you know, nothing really is special. It's like one and a half hour, two hours of like distilled knowledge about the topic. And so because I met a, a great guy, Bart, uh, another Bart <laughs> in Poland, and 
we became friends, let's say, and he has an, a video course production studio. So I spent quite uh, some time with him. He helped me craft the idea, the content and everything around that. And then we recorded the course actually in his studio. So I got a lot of also insights. He, he, he created a lot of courses. He helped other people create courses. So I got a lot of insights and feedback. He also helped me like find keywords that could be used. So it's, it's searchable. So that's, that's the short story. And also that was, to be honest, that was also an experiment because, you know, all my audience in previous courses uh, is in Poland. And these people told me like, hey, Piotr, you, you have pretty good English. You can train in English. I would really recommend everything you do to my English speaking friends. But you have none. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you have like three articles or five articles, ten. That's it. And that was, let's say, a test maybe also. Like, hey, I'll create the best thing I can and see if, if, it, just, if it works. So, Piotr, so, so just going from, from a, a, a face-to-face facilitator and taking content online, what are some of the biggest challenges that you had to face and, and how did you actually overcome them to take your, your three years body of knowledge and distill it down into something that's now actually accessible online? It really depends on the way you you are going to teach because there are various online courses. Let's say the the typical online course is just like talking head, (laughs) (laughs) recorded Mm -hmm. the video with some sometimes with some slides. That's it. Okay, I have some problems with thinking about it as as a course, but okay, it it provides some knowledge, and then you can build on top of that multiple layers. So. Layer number one is like quizzes, tests, and stuff like that, or additional materials, something that your students can play with uh, or be challenged or have, um, let's say, a time to to test what they learned or put to practice. And this is what happens in offline class. And in online class, actually, the statistics I've read is about, let's say, 20% of courses are really got to the end. So if 100 people purchase the course, actually 20 get to the last um, lesson. So why? Because they are not engaged. And there's also no group. There's no facilitator present. This is what we all have in an offline training. So there are multiple puzzles that you can put into your course. But then the more puzzles you have, the more time you have to spend on it. So there's also a a trade-off on price versus the effect it has. So the second thing is is things like quizzes and tests, which can be embedded in the course. Then you can add some group or community that help themselves. So that's what I actually love about, about being a trainer, that, uh, that in offline training, a lot of time people discuss among themselves. And so they learn from themselves as well as from, let's say, best practices. And it really deepens the knowledge. So I think community is another thing. In online course and the last thing is let's say my personal presence that hey if people ask questions I'm there and so Udemy can help with uh, or platforms like this can help with you having your content online usually in the form of video there are quizzes and and tests which actually are like a form of practice from offline courses then you can ask questions as well but for me, there's no community. There's no real community. Like, hey, I can ask my fellow friends from the course, what do they think about some, uh, some specific topic? And so, so this is like, if you're asking how I transitioned from offline to online, then it's like the cheap courses are usually mostly recorded quizzes and stuff like that. But then the more expensive have more group and my presence as well. I, I, before we got started, Bartosz and I had a whole discussion about the migration from, from class environments to going online and, and the trend that many people are now going to webinars, which is just, it's one person standing and kind of vomiting information onto the other people. And, uh, and the courses we're presenting People came back afterwards like, that was so interactive. It's not what I was expecting because the kind of the level out there is you, you attend and you sit back for, for two hours while this person is just taking you through those things. And I think that's the big challenge is, is, is like you said, to, to 
to get the personal interaction or to get interaction and learning from one another. I think those are two huge um, things to learn, even just while facilitating online discussions or having an online course. Do you ever do online, uh, live online interaction with, with clients as well? It's usually uh, in smaller groups, uh, but yes. And <laughs> I hope my webinars are not just vomiting information. <laughs> but even in some uh, in f in one of the courses, I have webinars every week for uh, four weeks. So there are four webinars, and then fifth is after you you finish the course. And I present some practicalities, but also I have open chat and people ask questions and comment and stuff like that. That that creates that let's say feel of hey, there are more of us. And then there's interaction because I sometimes laugh out of comments and stuff. So I think it works pretty well for big audiences that you just want to pass some really practical hints. But for things like training that are more, let's say, soft, uh, that you have to sometimes see how people do things and you have to have visual feedback, then, yeah, that, this is something I rarely do. But And if I do, it's usually one-on-one -on, -one on things like Zoom or uh, Hangout or th stuff like that. Because then we can share screen and, and get immediate feedback. I'm also thinking... Uh about the community aspect of things. Most people in L&D have this crazy dream that they're going to be creating these thriving, uh, open learner communities where everyone will come together, share knowledge, exchange. <laughs> and there's, there are many assumptions behind that, as you can see, right? So you mentioned a, having a platform to do this already helps. But what advice would you give to someone just starting out a learning community? I don't know if I'm really good at that. Uh, I learned some things and I see see it working to some extent uh, because people, when they are taking online courses, they usually do it to save time. So I can do online course in 10 minutes a day. And I have interviewed people after my courses that said, you know, I'm there just for a course. I didn't, sometimes I read the comments or the discussion, but sometimes I didn't even do that, not mentioning like being engaged. And that's also okay. And for me, the, the big steps are first, like make it easy and ask for a small thing in the beginning that's really personal. So my first lesson in this uh, Polish 30 days habit forming course, when the first lesson, I, I specifically ask people, hey, please say hello to everyone and write just one sentence about what you do and what are your expectations and what are you struggling with. And then... There are first few people that write these comments usually in the morning. And then when other people see that there are some comments already, they usually read it and say, hey, why won't I comment too? And so, and sometimes they also see, oh my God, I'm the only, I'm not the only one that has this problem. It's so <laughs> encouraging. So they write another comment. Oh, it was so good to hear that. And then this is, so I would start with something really, really easy that opens people to just like one very quick action. And the other action I did as an experiment is I put a Google map embedded or like link to Google map and ask people to tag themselves where they are more or less without really any personal details, just like what places did you join from? And this worked really great because I have the map and when you people from curiosity just open this map and see, oh, wow, we have like 20 people from Krakow. But one of the person is in Australia, which is actually strange <laughs> because the course is in Polish. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then like we get this when so there's a point that you open the map and see the whole world because the pins are like from ev all over the world with like points in Warsaw, Krakow and other. So that was that's probably the intro to the topic. <laughs> Piotr, I love that. I, th I think many, many a times what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reverse engineer um, like online facilitation. So we take what we know from the classroom and we're trying to see how that fits onto an online platform. Whereas actually the online platform now has new things that we haven't even thought about that's not possible in a face-to-face, -face, you know, four-by-four -four room. Uh, so to, uh, that is such a great example of just using the technology to get people involved in a different way. Is there any other tips like that that you've come across that, that makes it different or, or some tricks or tools that, that you use differently online than you would generally use in a classroom? Uh, so the first comment is like maybe transitioning from offline to online course, and it's, it's maybe not a transition. It's like a different product for me. 
it's completely different thing. So wow. the thing from offline class, they don't work in online. It's just, and in online, you have m many more tools. So that's the answer to your question. Like, what else do I do? So with online, that's usually a study about how people learn online and what they do. People are comfortable with like reading an article and then trying to, let's say, practice the knowledge. So one of my courses is fully text. It's online course that's fully text. <laughs> this is probably strange in these times. But what I found out is that people said, you know, if I work in a corporation and I watch an online course that's video and you don't have that big logo of Udemy, Skillshare or anything like that, then people think I'm watching YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to do that course at work, but at home, I don't want to spend my private time to do like, a, let's say, work-related course. So they actually said that the text course is pretty good because it looks like they are reading some materials, which is actually true. So that was one experiment with, uh, with that. The second was I added reports after each lesson. So that's basically 30 short lessons. So that's the habit formation course. So uh, there is the, where the insight come from. Very short lesson, like three minutes, and then one practical task to do which is usually three to five minutes for most of the lessons. For example, uh, your task for today is to observe your level of energy and draw a chart. <laughs> like, where, when is your 100%? Or when do you hit the low? How long is the low? And so people draw their charts and share it, uh, sometimes with others. But also, this lesson has a report to fill. And report is only between me and this, this person. Nobody else see it. And this report has a deadline. <laughs> so they know it's usually 36 to 48 hours to finish the uh, report. It's, sometimes it's just one sentence, but providing, hey, I had some thinking process around the lesson. And if you don't uh, fill your two reports in a row, you're kicked out of the class. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's not a joke. People pay me to kick them out of the class. And and the survey at the end, they say that was the most beautiful thing I could do. Because uh, there's a day 10 or lesson number 10 that you're tempted not to do it. You skipped one lesson and then you skipped another and I think, oh, I'll catch up on the weekend. And it never happens. But if they get the warning message, hey, I don't see your report. And if, you, if it's not there for another 12 hours, you just, you're kicked out of the course. Also, there's a, like a part of first seven to 10 days that if you, if you want to resign or you're kicked out, then I, I give money back. That's, that's usually not a formula for you. So people are also happy about this as well. But actually, 90, 91 or 92% people finish the course, so which is really crazy result for me. And that's, that's mostly because I'm, <laughs> I'm asking them to fill reports, and if not, they're kicked out. And the report is really quick. This is usually, you know, one sentence showing that they really got through the lesson and they thought about it for at least one minute. Because we are forming habits, and this is the, this is the let's say, area that I'm in. How to form really good habits that stick. And for that, you need to do small steps, but every day. So that's number two, I think, or number three. So being there, asking for comments sometimes. I'm asking people to comment. Hey, from the previous lesson, what helped you the most? Do you have any insights? And then there are just a few people that started. And then the rest usually follows. And I'm also okay with that, that after two weeks uh, of the course, the number of comments drops radically. But then... In the last week, it usually goes up again. There's nothing really more that I can think of right now. I think there are links to additional materials. So in the lesson, I usually stick to some, some core of the message. And if this is the area that people want to work more, there are links to multiple more materials, just if they want. So there is a, let's say, fast track <laughs> <laughs> that you do like 10 minutes a day. But usually there's one, two, three or five lessons that tell people, oh yeah, that's really what I want to work on. And then they have plenty of more additional materials. Pierre, what I love about that is instead of going to a habit-forming workshop for two days in a row 
and getting all that information. <laughs> you actually have like, you know, little piece meals scattered through through 30 days. And the result thereof is actually is, is actually a lot better, which we couldn't do in a physical place. There's no way someone is going to drive to a place to get a five minute course for 30 days in a row. And, and, and I think that's just one of the examples of something that's available online. Bartos, you had a question. I wonder about the other side because you're the instructor and I can see that you're very clever about engineering the experience. And I choose my words carefully because it is engineered. It is, you know, you, you see what works, you discard what doesn't, and then you create a formula out of it, delivering a course. But on the other end, you have a client, someone who will be on the receiving end of it. So have you ever wondered what makes a good learner? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so first thing, I need to have people that are willing to learn and Usually the, the fact that they have to purchase the course and it's not that cheap. Usually, um, let's say I have people in the course that were ready to take this step. Because if the course was for free or something like that, I would just do it whenever I want and then I would drop out with no consequences. And so people have to be in the, in the real moment to be ready to take the knowledge and practice it. So they have to have some time for it. And for me, that's usually made with just a purchase. <laughs> hey, I'm ready for that. I'm willing to take the effort and I'm putting my money into the process. And it's then it's kind of commitment. So this is the commitment we also have in, in offline course. If someone, you know, use their budget or just enter the classroom. That's a kind of commitment. And this commitment online is usually through purchase. Most of my dropouts are people who, uh, who let's say, the company paid for their course, so they didn't have to put their own blood into it. So commitment would be number one and could be achieved in multiple things, in multiple ways. For example, also with like the social aspect that, hey, when I said what's my motivation for the course and I introduced myself, it's really hard now to, to drop. So so that will be number one and one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think good learner wants to put what they learn in practice and they are happy to experiment. For me, that yeah, that's that's probably one of the key aspects. I also love when people experiment and say, hey, yeah, I, I tried that technique and it, wor and it didn't work. They sometimes challenge me also. That's also another beautiful thing for the learner. So if you know this Kolb cycle, I think we could talk about it for another half an hour. <laughs> There's when people have uh, some experience, then they start to think about it. And without this thinking, if you get to knowledge, no learning is actually completed. Because that's, I just consumed the knowledge about it, but without this real reflection on why is it so. So, for example, in time management, people sometimes share Pomodoro technique. And then Pomodoro says 25 minutes of focus time and then five minute break. And then why? Why 25 minutes? Why not 50 or 15? <laughs> like, and then... This, this is this thinking process, the real reflection, that when people get to knowledge, they really uh, know why. So for me, that's a crucial aspect for, for every learner to have that reflection part also. Piaz, I'm taking so much, um, I, I want to say pleasure, but I'm, I'm, I'm finding so much reassurance from, from, from your approach. One of the conversations that, that I've recently had is, will there be a future for facilitators? Will there still be a future for, apart from recording a course and putting it online, is there still a, a need for an interaction? And what I'm hearing from you is very much so that there still needs to be a person to take someone through the process. Yeah, I have so many feedback from people about it. So, so this Polish course was, course was finished, let's say, by a thousand people already. And this on Udemy, there's like 3000 right now, but it's like I have much less feedback about it. So for this online course that, that's finished by 91% of the people or somewhere there, what I do is the first day I have roughly, the, the limit is 150 participants. And day one, I record a one minute video personal introduction to everyone. And that skyrockets the uh, engagement. 
uh, and people in the end says I was shocked. You know, it's like I usually say something personal. Hey, I see you logged in. This is the morning. I really recommend uh, like taking the course in the mornings if you only can. So and then like few practical tips on how to do it through the next steps and good luck. And that usually blow people minds because they are not they they are not used to being welcomed one on one, even by one minute video. And it usually says, "Hey, I'm seen. I'm like what I do matters. You see it." And then yeah, it skyrockets the engagement. That's what I what I saw. But for the facilitation, uh, if I answer the comments or questions like every hour or two, usually during the day during the course. Usually people say, "I felt you were there. It really helped." So I, I believe this like huge uh, work for uh, facilitators online, because people don't want to click, people don't want to just you know gather knowledge. Because I can watch YouTube, I can do other stuff, and even on YouTube you have these comments or you can have thumb up or something like that, that people crave for this interaction, and. That's not only interaction, but also, hey, you are seen, you're valuable, and you matter. I think that's the the experience we have to create. That's not only like pushing knowledge <laughs> on you, but it's also like a fun aspect of learning and fun aspect of being social. That's probably a primary need for every person, right? Like, have fun, be social, and develop. Wow! 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 We just went from engineering the course. Into hacking the hell out of the formula, because <laughs> honestly, look, if you work with online instructors, nobody, I don't think people truly pay attention to comments. It's more like, you know, duty hours. I used to work at the university. They tell you to have your duty hours. You know, pretty much the door is open. Nobody comes, but you're expected to be there, right? But you've completely turned this formula upside down. This is like personal greeting for everyone. Wow, I've never heard of anyone do this. Is it something you? Borrowed from someone? Is it something you developed by your experience?、Uh, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Be out thought of everything. <laughs> <laughs> of course, like most of I do is let's say borrowed. What I usually do is like glue the parts together that really make sense for me. So I took、uh, actually I took a course on podcasting. That's pretty funny.、Uh, And in the course about podcasting, the guy、uh, actually greeted me one on one. At that time, it was strange because that was、uh, that was strange but nice.、Uh, what I liked about it is the feeling that I'm seen, but also I thought it could be pre-recorded with my name because everything else was like generic. <laughs> And I thought, it, would it be awesome if in my course I greet people personal with a name? But also have something that they know this is for them. It was not like pre-recorded, and this is the, the the path I went through. So yes, of course I borrowed it. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine receiving a greeting. Hello, Piotr. <laughs> How are you <laughs> doing today on the fifth of May? <laughs> going going full robot. <laughs> no, but imagine you know I'm recording like. Uh, I'm recording a greeting for Bart, and then I have another Bart, and there's a temptation <laughs> to send you the same <laughs> greeting because I already have it, and there's actually a finite number of names. So there's a day that everything's ready. I just push the button and it's sent. So I didn't want that feeling because that feels terrible when you think something is personalized but it's pre-recorded. Then it's it feels even worse that it it wouldn't be there. Yeah,、uh, you, you mentioned you took the course on podcasting.、Uh, I'm tempted to ask why, but I, I want to make a much broader question out of this. So, what type of? Because、uh, I can see you're a naturally curious learner. What you actually say, your learners do. So to sort of apply what they learn. So, what sort of learning are you after when you take online classes? Yeah, <laughs> the word practical is probably something that that it's on top of my mind. When I take the course, I usually want some skill. That's it. When I want some gen- more general knowledge, I usually watch some people on YouTube or just read a book. Which book、uh, books are my actually my preference now, but.、Uh, If I want to learn how to do drums in Logic Pro, <laughs> then I take course on drums in Logic Pro. That's it. If I want to have a, like a guy who 
uh, did the first podcast in Poland and runs it for 10 last years. If this guy produced a podcast, I know I can get a lot of insight from him. And this is when I take the course. Sometimes I also take the course to have access to the instructor and being able to connect and like able to ask questions or like form just a bit of relationship because I usually value those people. And sometimes I purchase the course, I don't even finish it. But then I know I'm like in groups. Uh, I have personal access to that person. But it for me, it's usually like very skill focused. Then I know I have to learn something. I find a course, usually see what others recommend and I take it. And so in online, actually, the difference also between offline and online uh, training, I think that's pretty big, is that everyone has its has his own pace. So there are people that want to finish the... So on Udemy, I see it, you know. There are people that purchased the course yesterday. And yesterday in the evening, I've seen they completed it. <laughs> it's like one hour, 40 minutes. There are some people that want to take one lesson after lunch or stuff like that. So that's like purely video. But even with that, some people want to take a course in the morning because it fits their, let's say, daily routine. Some late evening <laughs> instead of Netflix or stuff like that. But with online, you have multiple choices. And in the class, everyone is stick to the same routine. And so also, I think online provides a lot of opportunities, like how to blend into people's lives so that they don't even actually maybe see that they are taking the course. It's like a part of their daily routine at, at some point. That Like the idea maybe of micro learning. I learn like five minutes a day after lunch, whatever I can. I mean, this is just blowing me out of the water, just the way of approaching this. And I think on the one hand, there's a lot more responsibility on the learner now. Because if, if I would like to learn something, it's available. Now, this connects with, with your content course as well on forming habits and things like that. So how, do, how can someone from our audience get into the habit of making L&D or making personal development part of their lives from a habit-forming point of view? The first thing is start small. Habits are usually very small. And I would start with the smallest possible bit that you can imagine that you would be even funny. <laughs> it's like starting your daily routine with one push-up. <laughs> it's a one push-up will take you nowhere uh, in terms of your right. physical appearance <laughs> or abilities. But this, it's not about, let's say, doing this one push-up. It's it's to create this time of day or this trigger that you, without even thinking, you just do it. And so, let's say, if you every week you add one more push-up after a year you do 50 push-ups <laughs> but if you start with 50 push-ups you do it for three days and then you die <laughs> and then you say oh it's really it takes so much time my 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 hands uh, hurt i cannot drive and stuff like that so you're thinking about problems so i think advice number one would be start really really slow and small maybe not slow but uh, predictably uh, every day but start really small so I would say think about the best time of your day when you want to learn it's, sometimes it's after lunch because you're like usually trying to get conscious uh, just for a moment or that's the morning uh, before the kids are awake or that's late evening that I want to let's say consume some um, some people have their energy peak in the late evenings and maybe that's a good moment. So I would find the, the moment that they would experiment with for some time. And then say, I spend five minutes a day to learn. So that's that, that would be number one for me. Create a very short spot for learning. And make it like the trigger constant. Then there is some reward necessary in the theory of habits. And this reward may be like thinking, hey, I did lesson number three. It's going really well. So... There's a need to feel the progress. One, the progress that I learned something that's practical that I can use. And the second thing is I see it on, let's say, a platform that's, let's say, more personed <laughs> or there's a personal interaction or stuff like that. So there, there has to be some kind of reward uh, of it. Uh, the more, let's say, 
not material, the better. <laughs> okay, so buying yourself a new watch every time you finish one chapter of your Udemy. <laughs> no, is not the way. No, to go. that's not the way to go. But I think the the mental things like, hey, it's really working well. Like, hey, this is the fifth day in a row that I'm reading something. So that would be number one. Number two is create a really clear cue, how to call it. Like, when I start my learning, there's no time to think what I do next. It's already ready, waiting for me. So if I have list of articles, it's there. It's like queue in my pocket application, or it's like a course that has multiple lessons, and I just run it, and it's the next lesson. So, so that would be number two. Like prepare yourself and prepare the materials. So when you're there, you just consume it, not think what to do. And number three for me, which probably the the most critical also in time management, is to be be guilt and shame free. Because what usually happens is that people that want to change their habits or form do it for like three, five, ten days, and then they 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 skip for some reason. That may be like they had headache or something like that, and then it's like, oh no, like again, I wanted to create that habit and. They self sabotage the whole effort because habit is not formed because you didn't skip any day. <laughs> habit is formed because you just repeat it, and so the sh- guilt and shame is one of the big emotional killers of habits. So I would say the the day you have this guilt and shame, oh, I dropped out of the course and it was going really well. It's like okay, this happens. What do I do next? And like feel okay that sometimes. Uh, skipping one or two lesson is not that bad. Of course, skipping, <laughs> it's just don't quit. So the rule of thumb that I ha- sometimes have is don't skip two lessons in a row. So I didn't do my morning routine today. Okay, that's really sad. Uh, but I'm not like self-sabotaging my morning efforts. I say, okay, I skip today because actually why? I don't feel well today. So there's like some kind of self-empathy. And then so what I do that I don't skip it tomorrow for sure. <laughs> um, m- many of our listeners are now locked in their own houses for obvious reasons, right? <laughs> and uh, we got, I-, I had so many conversations with people uh, sort of guilt tripping that, oh, I need, I need to start some yoga or I need to read more. And everybody else is on LinkedIn. Everybody else is sharing those posts, how they are like delivering double the volume uh, of sales. And this makes me sort of itchy and shaky. And you're looking, you're looking at your to-do list that you had planned beginning of April and now beginning of May, you go like, I'm not the person I wanted to be. So um, what's your advice for people like that who sort of feel feel threatened that they're the only immovable part of the world that's moved on? I think this is maybe not obvious or sound really strange, but this is called self-empathy. And feeling okay with how I am, not comparing myself to others. If I'm sad, I'm sad. It probably has a reason. I probably should stop and 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 reflect on that. If I'm angry that I'm locked down in a in my flat, that's probably also has a reason that maybe this is this is actually calling me. Emotions are are calling us to stop and reflect because something really important happens. And of course, I can compare myself to others, but that's not the point. That's how I am. I'm I look at this face in a mirror every day. That's the only guy I have to be okay with. <laughs> I don't care about the rest for a moment. So it would be number one is like admitting that what I feel is okay, whatever it is, even if it's anger or sadness or stuff like that. The second thing is the realization that usually people that in such crazy times that provide so big uncertainty, if they produce a lot of content, usually this is the way for them to challenge their own emotions. <laughs> so what's, let's say, if I, I feel really bad, what I could do? I'm from Poland, so we usually drink a lot, okay? <laughs> that, <laughs> that usually helps, okay? That's, that's actually a sad story. It's like, you know, adult children of alcoholics and stuff like that. That's, you know, guys, like, I actually, I live over a grocery store here in Poznan, Poland, and they have this special deal where if you buy 12 beers, you get 12 extra beers for free. <laughs> Yeah, welcome to, <laughs> to Western, Eastern Europe. 
so uh, yeah, so, so some, some people can drink, you can take drugs or stuff like that just to feel okay back, to feel okay again. People have multiple uh, stuff to do that. Some, and that's, that's actually not very, um, very well welcomed by our society. It's like, hey, you're drinking or you're smoking or you're taking drugs. Like, that will be not really positive. But if you say, uh, if you become a workaholic, <laughs> everyone can say, oh, Louis, you work so, you work so, oh, you work so hard. You really take care about you, your future, or maybe your family or stuff like that. So actually, this may be an addiction that's actually positively uh, judged by society, which is really dangerous. And sometimes, so that's how the way you can also look at people that create a lot of content. They may be just addicted people that they have. This is their way to cope with their own emotions, to produce more, produce more, because they don't have to stop and feel. Because the moment you stop, you realize you feel not really okay. So what do you do? Uh, and actually, that's a really good time to reflect for me, because if there are so many changes in the world right now, it's like... Uh, in Poland, we recently had an event that there was a thunderstorm in the mountains and, and people died there because of that thunderstorm. That was really a big story in our TV. And so why? Because they drove uh, for some miles to get there and then they had a plan to go on a path and go back. And the thunderstorm was not in the plan, <laughs> but they decided to go anyway. And this is... This is something I would, uh, let's say, tell people not to do, maybe. Because the moment you hear the first thunder or you see the clouds, this is the moment to stop. Look at what you're seeing. And maybe the best thing to do is just go back as quickly as possible or hide in the first shelter that you find or thing like that. So maybe sometimes people that produce content is just like, so I just go faster and then poof, thunder and that's it. <laughs> Thanks for being the voice of reason here. I think there's a very, very important message that uh, mm. needs to be heard mm. out there. I just, I just want to say that the, the sentence I took from there is emotions are, so, are calling us to stop and reflect. And I think in this time, when we have so much time, many times the, the, the only thing we don't want to do is to stop or to actually take time and look in the mirror and, and be okay with that person there because we're confronted with so many things that we don't want to face. Yeah, and I think it's 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 the calling of 21st century to because for now it's like if you're bored, you go for entertainment, not for challenge. Or if you feel not okay, you don't stop and like live with that and like emotions are just really come and go like like clouds. You don't have to do anything special about them sometimes and they just come and go, but then you have like a bigger uh, reflection on what they bring or what are your values. That's why is it so? It's touching you so much that others are not touched at all. So this is this beautiful reflection of if I'm really emotional, it means it touched something really uh, personal and important for me. And uh, we live in right now in a times that you feel some emotion that's not nice. Then you just do something to feel nicer. <laughs> and sometimes it's okay, but sometimes our emotions are calling us to like stop and reflect. Uh, that's how you, that's what you said. And and I really I I really agree with that. If if we learn to stay with our discomfort just for a while, it's not like staying with the discomfort for a month <laughs> because then you have like you, you're diagnosed with depression. But you know, if you have an evening that's really sad and you reflect that maybe this is the end of the world as we knew it and then reflect on it. It's not really pleasurable thought to have, but then maybe you reflect in a day or two or three and then you're back with your energy with, uh, with some reflection that you don't have to escape that again. Uh, so that will be my approach, but then we get to more philosophical stuff on <laughs> <laughs> learning and time management. <laughs> but, you know, one thing comes to my mind when I um, when I visualize the reflection, this this process, these um, turning cogs that need to stop for a while, and so that we can sort of oil them, realign them, so that when we move forward, many of my friends sometimes confess to me that. They, they've done that. They've realigned, they sort of, they stopped, they reflected, and they have 
this feeling that I need to move forward. And they have this thing they want to do, read a yoga class, picking up a guitar, you know, like a wellness thing, you know, going to the swimming pool or something. And they usually postpone it until, oh, it's usually Monday. Monday is the right date to start new things. Like right? you, your new diet should start on Monday. Uh, opening that book, that's a Monday thing as well. Definitely not a Friday afternoon uh thing no and you know the gym oh that's a totally monday thing uh you see where i'm coming from like what would you say to someone who's who's looking for that i believe they're called magical dates of magical time to get all the ducks in a row and then slide into hmm. the experience so first thing would be to reflect <laughs> that's a, that's a no, joke. we've done that we've, we've reflected <laughs> we've... <laughs> the the reflection is Asking myself, what worked in the past for me? Mm -hmm. So do I have any changes in my life that's, that stick? Because, you know, there, I believe there's, like, we can have some generalization, but then there's no silver bullet for everyone because, like, everyone is different. And so some people have to start with something big, with, like, you know, the hit of a hammer, and then they knew they started, uh, and that works beautiful for them. And then Monday is fine, And then you do two hours of CrossFit on Monday and you can't walk or do anything. <laughs> and then you feel, and then you feel, okay, I started. There are some people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people are motivated by um, not cooperation, but being competitive with others. Mm -hmm. And then what would help is not Monday, but having a friend who's just about at the same level that I am, that I can compete with. So usually if you look at the past, you see such patterns. So uh, this is actually for your whole life. Uh, so this is a pretty effective thing to do to stop and reflect what worked in the past. But usually there are a few strategies. Uh, first is to, for some people, start really small saying, okay, if not Monday, but today, what's the smallest possible piece that I could start today? So not starting with like 15 minutes morning routine exercises, but like, what if I do one exercise that takes me two or three minutes? What would that be that I start today or tomorrow? That's for some people. <laughs> for some, there's uh, um, being competitive. For sure, uh, finding a partner always helps. That I have uh, a group, even very small group of people that do what I do. That brings this beautiful feeling that even if I do my 10 push-ups in the morning, I feel there's someone else in the world doing this the same push-ups. That I can sometimes share uh, how I was, what I feel, um, what helped me, what um, distracts me and stuff like that. Uh, so I would say having really clear thing in mind. So I would exercise every morning. No, you won't. <laughs> I will do 20 push-ups in the morning. Yes. Okay. That's it. So the more concrete it is, the, the better the chance that you actually form it. So I, I often hear like, what habit do you want to form? I want to be nicer to people. <laughs> okay. Okay. You want to be nicer to people. What's your habit? Okay. I want to smile when I see people I don't know. Okay. That's a habit you can form. Mm -hmm. Uh, really small, repeatable with clear trigger. Um, so I would start small with something really concrete, find uh, people that will do that with me. Sometimes for people that I'm also um, accountable. So I say, hey, I will do this at this progress before that date. <laughs> Some people are like that, that they, they have to be uh, like take accountable. But anyway, some social aspect to that start small or start very big or at least mm -hmm. that big that gives me a pleasure of achieving something meaningful and then the strategy of not uh, like skipping a few things in a row I think for start that's that should do the work so are you saying that our strategy of making this show the most popular show on the planet might be a bit flawed <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> um, now my guilt I mean, and shame we're... comes in <laughs> <laughs> we are probably focusing on the the end result rather than 
the little practices and the little actionable things that can actually be done and formed and reforged into habits, right? So, yeah, I, I'm really strong advocate of habits because they clear out the obvious stuff out of your way and then you can focus on what really matters. So if you have your task list ready and you have an, a, a habit of using it and cleaning it with really no, almost no effort, then you can really focus on what you want to do, not on how do I clean up my task list because it's so big I cannot focus. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of habits. Yeah, and also this is the way that usually we operate every day. Like you drive your car and you can talk at the same time uh, or you don't stand in a front of your toilet and think should i flush it or not <laughs> it's like <laughs> you just you, you do it automatically okay and and so if we automate many of these things then you have time and energy for things that matter i think it's liberating to hear that because i think many people out there um and we start in the realm of learning and learning in 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 my mind it is the ultimate go to the gym on monday type of activity right? Because it's super easy to put off. It's super easy to procrastinate on your exams and reading up on your books. And if you have some sort of a development project in your mind without being actionable about this, then it's just a dream that sort of flies away. Mm. And actually, so, so it blends beautifully to the topic of learning and actually having good habits as dopamine, this beautiful hormone that actually drives much of our behavior and sometimes somehow we lost it so now people get dopamine shots by facebook and notifications and stuff like that so this is why we get so addicted to it and i think with also with the exercises what gives us back the dopamine is learning and learning is through experimenting because if i'm experimenting i'm curious so even now people ask, okay, Piotrek, what are your three pieces of advice for people that want to start exercising in the morning or stuff like that? And then I practice them and say, it doesn't work. <laughs> this guy told bullshit mm -hmm. or, or something like that. <laughs> but if you turn your mind into curiosity and experimenting, that's a completely different story. It's like, hey, I'll try his strategy in the morning for a week and see what happens. And then there's my curiosity, my dopamine shot that I get from learning. And I think this is the, like the ultimate uh, shift that we have to do. It's, it's how do we stay curious when you form your habits or you want to start to, I don't know, organize your time. We usually want fast answers and sometimes they are there. But then the question is, okay, what if you run an experiment about this or that? So last example, a guy asked me um, in a course, uh, planning and summarizing a week, what's better, uh, Friday or Sunday? And then like five minutes later, he resp replied to himself, okay, I already know what, you, what you'll answer. <laughs> Experiment with Sunday, reflect on that, and if it doesn't work, move to Friday or maybe to some other place. And if we, if we feel comfortable with that changing, then we are in the learning process and we get these dopamine shots and it's all fun, mm. actually, because mm -hmm. it's not like I have to stick to my routine <laughs> for like, because yeah, it's <laughs> about my self-worth. But it's like, hey, why don't I experiment with this in the morning mm -hmm. for five minutes for the next two weeks and see what happens? Then the, the whole like pressure gets out of it. Then we are like a small children again, like, hey. What happens if we do this? <laughs> Isn't that the essence of agile project management and Scrum in general? Uh, validate your experimentation and sort of transfer into learning. So with, when it comes to time, project management, we have this usually waterfall and agile practices. And they, they are for two different purposes. Mm. If things are predictable, like, I don't know, building a house, then waterfall will work great. And I think this is just... You have this book of best practices. You just do it. You don't overthink how a roof is made or stuff mm. like that. And waterfall will actually produce the best result in that area. But if we are not sure about the results, 
then what we're left with is experimenting. And this is where Agile actually comes in and saying, because we cannot predict the future because nobody probably done it in the past in the software development. It's like, we have never used that technology with that technology on that servers with that infrastructure. This is like a whole big experiment. There's no book on that, how to do this, because it's probably the first or the fifth time in the world that somebody does it. So Agile is in, in, in its heart for me, an, an experimenting framework, or let's say Scrum to be more specific, because Agile is like an umbrella of, of ideas. Mm -hmm. But then this is the, the idea. We don't know where we're going to get. So let's plan a short step forward and then see where we go, reflect on that, <laughs> retrospect and move on. So yeah, basically I, I fully agree. But but then people, let's say from the old world, old not understanding the difference, try to bring it back to this old predictable book of best practices. And then the, the, where's, when's the fight? Because sometimes actually waterfall is better for some projects. When it's you know repeatable, you can uh, take some, let's say knowledge out of your constant experimenting. Then you have this really nice book of best practices that you can just use right away. Piotr, I'm, I'm, finding, I'm finding so much release just with regards to, to where we are, you know, taking facilitation, taking coaching. You know, we had a book of best practice, you know, our, our, our book, uh, book of knowledge of how to do facilitation and how to do coaching face to face. We're moving into a new online. For many of us, it's a new online. Um, and to just have the, I want to, I don't want to say a, a permission, but to have that approach of saying, we're going to experiment. We're going to yeah. try something new. We're going to record a video at the beginning of the session and say, hi, Bart, <laughs> welcome to the session. And we're going to see how it works. And through that, in the next couple of months, create our own book of knowledge to go, this is how Louis does it. And, and to be, and to be intrigued about the new possibilities that are there and not trying to take an old methodology and putting it into uh, uh, agile space to say, okay, but it's going to work. You know, we built a house that way. So obviously we need to build a, a Facebook page and profile the same way. And, and, and to connect those things, I'm, I'm really excited to, um, to stop and reflect and really see, you know, what are the options or what are the possibilities that, um, that this, this new opportunity actually allows for us to have. Bart, are some reflections from your side? So many, so many. I love the way you connect the dots. This is, this makes so much sense. I think, Many people in our field, in the areas of uh, facilitation, coaching and management, uh, want to have the handbook of doing X, right? And want to, uh, and instead of being on a journey of curiosity, looking for things that may or may not work, we try to stick to the safe side of things and look for the best practices out there, right? This happened to me just yesterday. I went on, um, I went on IMDb and I wanted to find the top 100 movies to watch just to make my journey through Netflix all that easier. <laughs> did that work for, out for me? No. Did I want to watch Saving Private Ryan again? No. But it is through exploration that we learn these things. So thank you so much for sharing all those insight with us today. Tell us. How do our listeners find you? What's your next big thing? Where do you live in this online space? Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably one place. The second is uh, my Udemy course, practicaltimemanagement.com. We will redirect you there. Uh, so that will be for now. Let's say that there are like two, two ways to connect. If someone is a Polish speaker, you can link productivity.pl, which is like my mother site. And then my next big thing is I will create a, a free, very short video course that will, yeah, that will be free for email management. It's so like I see people struggling a lot with it, like how to find it, how to organize it, what are the best practices. And then my probably uh, my next big thing would be focusing for IT again after four years and creating a course specifically for uh, developers that were promoted to team leaders. Oh my, oh my, so much goodness. So we have practicaltimemanagement.com that takes you to Udemy. Yep. Uh, we highly recommend that course. That is an all-star course. Comes highly recommended firsthand from the learners. Look at how organized we are in this show. This is like, <laughs> this is how, this is what you can achieve with Piotr's course. Um, so we have, we have that. We have you on Udemy. Uh, you can look for Piotr Nabielet. That's a Polish C, so you pronounce this K, but everything you'll be able to find in the show notes 
below all the links out there. And when you reach out to Piotr, just make sure that Louis and Barter sent you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Piotr from South Africa, thank you so much for your time and all the insights. And uh, yeah, and the forced reflection that I now need to go and do about my time in lockdown. Wow, thanks. He's already reflecting. There's no saving him now. <laughs> Remember, no guilt and shame. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> So, Louis, we just had our conversation with uh, Piotr Nabielec, our productivity expert and an online instructor. What were your takeaways from that brief conversation we had with him? Bojos, there's, there's so many things. I, th I think the, the one biggest thing that stood out for me is just his, his comment to say that online does not equal classroom presentations, that it's two different formats, it's two different ways, and we are not reverse engineering the one to fit into the other one the online space has got so many options for us um that we can be creative in and just our conversation at the end is is to take that old format and say okay let's press pause on that let's think anew let's experiment let's see what what new things we are we can actually apply um you know his thing of a personal a personal hello before you start the course the option of having a course run over 30 days for five minutes each which just gives it a, a new way of applying the content. I'm, from, a, from a facilitator point of view, I'm really, really excited about that. From a personal point of view, there's just so many things that I got from this. You know, Instilling habits, um, being able to, to follow through with things that we want to start. And, and the thing that he, he underlined the whole time was, you know, emotions is calling us. If you have an emotion, there's something that, you, that we need to address. And I, I think for me, just to be able to sit with that, And to be okay with that. Uh, I, I think it's, yeah, it's, I, I, there's so many things I want to reflect on for, uh, because of this. For you, Bartos, what, uh, what reflections are you taking from this? For me, the most interesting one was about making the commitment and making the step to deciding as a learner to enter this new mindset of doing something. We talked about putting things off until Monday. Um, and it was also very liberating to hear Piotr say that this is also okay. It's, it's okay that you're taking your time and it's okay that you're putting things off even as long as you take the time to reflect and understand what really worked in the past, how you can apply. So there is, there are many liberating structures in his thinking. Uh, I'm not sure if he realizes that. For someone who's been putting off learning for, for years, this is perhaps the only voice of reason out there, which is actually rooting for the learner. Look at the world outside. Everybody out there is about giving you the one hack that works or five productivity tips that will change your life or one uh, habit that Elon Musk does every day when he's uh, <laughs> driving his Tesla. It's just, there's just so much noise. And, and I really appreciate how Piotr makes sense out of this. He goes, D do what might work, reflect on it, apply, re reforge. So there's a lot of agility in what he's saying in actually this conversation makes me want to come back to the scrum guide which is the the bible of running things this way um just to mm. see what bits i missed and sort of reflect on it again so that was uh that was a big one i think the one thing that stood out for me at the end is uh, it was kind of a throwaway remark that he just said when we're bored we go to entertainment instead of to challenge and i think for me that is That is a, in a constant learning environment to go like, okay, so if, if I'm having five minutes, what do I want to really spend my time on? Do I want to go for entertainment or do I want to go for challenge? And I think that's, for me, that's a personal like, okay, let's get this going. Um, and I hope for the listeners as well. I hope there's a, a couple of personal challenges that's been put out there just in the way of thinking and the way of, of applying our personal best going forward in this time that we have. Absolutely. We wish you all to be your best, to do your productivity routines <laughs> and enjoy the rest of the lockdown. From Poland, this is Bartosz signing off. From South Africa, this is Louis. Enjoy your day and see you on the other side. Thank you for listening to our show. If you have any questions or you'd like to be interviewed, drop us a line at ask at amazingmeetings.org. That's ask at amazingmeetings.org. Until the next time, bye. Bye.